in our third lecture, primarily tried to understand the pre-modern phase of the development of the state. Our concern, as I have already told you, is to understand how the modern state has emerged, how the modern state, as we experience it in our life today, has developed, has uh, gone through a kind of historical process. And to understand this historical process, we have to first understand the pre-modern phase that we have done. Now we take up the next phase, that is the modern phase. Now, to understand how the modern phase how the modern state has developed. We have to, in this particular lecture, to be, we have to be engaged in the process of understanding or we have to appreciate the process of understanding the transition from pre-modern to modern. That is, in the transition from pre-modern to modern, they are developed another kind of state which was a break with the pre-modern phase that is broadly known as the rise of the absolute state in Europe. And our primary concern in this lecture is to first understand how this absolute state in Europe developed. Now this understanding of the rise of the absolute state in Europe has to be done on two levels. One historical, the other is intellectual. Historically, the absolute state's emergence became a necessity. It became a necessity because Europe, by the end of the Middle Ages, when feudalism was coming to a close, when the feudal society was disintegrating, well, it was marked by a state of confusion, anarchy, and chaos. A number of wars, for example, 100 years war, for example, 30 years war, well, these wars virtually ravaged and destroyed Europe, Europe's society, Europe's economy, Europe's polity. And so Europe was very much looking for a kind of order, looking for a kind of central order, looking for a kind of central authority, which would actually end this period of chaos. And so what was necessary now, and that became the urgency of the time, that became the demand of the time, that is to put an end to dual authority, to put an end to the fragmented authority, which we have already seen was the characteristic of the feudal state. So what was necessary now was to give birth to a sort of power, a sort of order, a sort of authority which would be centralized, which would actually accept no other parallel authority. This provides the clue to the historical clue rather to the rise of the absolute state. Now, while historically the rise of the absolute state, it became an, a kind of Im imperative, it became a kind of say need of the hour. The rise of the absolute state in Europe cannot be understood properly. It cannot be explained properly unless we also take into account the contributions of a number of leading theorists who actually made very important contributions to the rise of the absolute state. Their contributions are important in the sense that it is these people, it is these intellectuals, it is these philosophers, these scholars, who actually through their writings made a plea for, they actually made a case for the rise of a kind of powerful state which would not accept, which would not uh, uh, in, a, in a way agree with any kind of parallel authority, which would challenge the authority of the state. That is, justification for an absolute state. Well, this was possible through the theoretical writings, which were the contributions of, say, three or four very 
leading figures of this period. One was rather two, there were two figures very important uh, coming from Italy. One was Dante, the other was Machiavelli and they were followed by Hobbes and actually first there was the French philosopher or French political theory Jean Boda and then English philosopher Thomas Hobbes. So these figures that is Dante and Machiavelli from Italy, Boda from France and Hobbes from England. These four figures were theoreticians of the absolute state. Of course, their viewpoints were not identical, but by and large, broadly speaking, well, they called for the rise of, they called for justification of an absolute state. Now, first of all, Dante's contribution. So far as Dante is concerned, there were at least four very important elements identified by Dante which went into the making of the modern state. They went into the making of the modern sense in the sense that they constituted the ingredients of the absolute state. And it is these ingredients of the absolute state which virtually were appropriated by the modern state as we witness it today. Now what were these four elements? First of all, Dante emphasized the need for a large population. Second, Dante called for a distinct geographical territory. That is, there must be a distinct geographical domain or geographical space over which the state would have absolute power or absolute control. Third, there have to be the spirit of unity. The state would be marked by the state would be founded on the spirit of unity, which in fact went into the making of nationalism much later. Fourth, a very uh, important feature of Dante's writings was that he made a clear distinction between the domain of the ruler, the power of the ruler, the authority of the ruler and the domain of the rule. That is, he very clearly, almost unambiguously stated that the ruler and the ruled, they live in two different spaces. The space of the ruler, well, it cannot be challenged by the space occupied by the ruled. So that is, those who are at the helm of power and those who are not at the helm of power, those who are rulers and those who are subjects, they constitute two different domains. They constitute two different spaces. This notion of Dante, which went into the making of the absolute state in Europe, well, it was later picked up by Machiavelli. Now, what was Machiavelli's contribution? Machiavelli's contribution was twofold. Number one, he made a very clear separation between religion and politics. And he made it also unambiguously clear that the, the domain of politics, it cannot be linked with the domain of religion. Religion is something private, whereas the domain of power, the domain of authority, the domain of state, that is public. And religion in no way, the church in no way, can intrude into the territory of the state. And this is how Machiavelli upheld the case for an absolute state which would be free from the control of the church. The second very important contribution of Machiavelli which followed from this particular understanding was this, that is an autonomous domain of politics. That is, politics constitutes an autonomous domain which would be guided by its own rules which would be guided by its own principles. These rules, these principles, they cannot be interfered with, they cannot be usurped, they cannot be invaded by any other authority. Then Buddha and Hobbes, Buddha belonging to 16th century, Hobbes belonging to the 17th century, they also in their own ways, Buddha particularly, pleaded for 
the necessity of instituting an absolute sovereign power. This sovereign power, this absolute power of the state would go unchallenged. It would not be controlled by, it would not be usurped by any other authority. And so this idea was also picked up by Hobbes and Hobbes in his theory of social contract, this thing we have already done in our uh, earlier lecture, that Hobbes in his theory of social contract tried to emphasize, tried to justify the idea of an absolute sovereign. And Hobbes also tried to underscore the idea that only by accepting the authority of the absolute sovereign, the people become free. And this is how a proper order can be established. A very uh, famous uh, scholar who has written on this subject, David Held, he has identified the following factors explaining the transition from pre-modern state to modern state in Europe via the rise of absolutism. That why, under what circumstances the absolutist state emerged? What are the factors, broadly speaking, explaining the rise of the absolutist state? According to Professor David Held, these were the factors. Number one, struggle between the king and his vassals, which in fact you have already seen was the story of feudalism. That is the story of divided loyalty. It had to come to an end. And so the rise of the absolute state actually was an illustration of the fact that this story of divided loyalty would ultimately have to come to a close. And thus this divided loyalty would ultimately have to be transcended by the establishment, institutionalization of a central powerful authority that is called the absolute state. Second, that point also we have briefly mentioned in our earlier lecture, that is the rise of the new commercial class, the rise of business activities, trade and commerce. These, these things ultimately, uh, or these, these forces eventually gave birth to the rise of a new society which challenged the notion of divided loyalty, which called for the rise of a centralized powerful authority, they, which called for a definite geographical territory, which called for an autonomous domain. And so this rise of the new commercial class, that also went into the making of the absolutist state. The third was, this was very, very important, that is a frontal challenge to the authority of the church. We have discussed in our earlier lectures that the entire story of feudalism, well, it was a story of tussle, tension, struggle, conflict, confrontation between the authority of the king and the authority of the church. Now, the rise of the absolute state, it was an indication that the authority of the church now would have to be subordinate to the authority of the king. And the rise of the absolute state actually was a vindication of this particular element that the authority of the church would ultimately have to go and the authority of the king that would have to be accepted as the, as the demand, the need of the hour. Now, two very distinguished scholars, scholars, one is Perry Anderson, the other is Anthony Giddens. These two scholars have very uh, broadly speaking, of, of course there are differences between the two scholars, but broadly speaking these two scholars have identified some of the elements which may broadly be characterized as the features of the absolute state. And if we take their views together, then we can identify some of the features of this absolute state which emerged in Europe. Now, let us take a quick look at these features after uh, or the way Giddens and uh, Anderson, well, they have identified, they have tried to understand the problem. 
The first one is bureaucracy. This was a feature which was a product of the absolute state. Bureaucracy, all of us know, without bureaucracy, the modern state cannot function. But the idea of bureaucracy, that is the idea of an institution, of a structure of power, which is manned by different kinds of administrative personnel who have the necessary expertise in running the administration and which virtually controls the nerve center of the government. Well, this rise of bureaucracy, the consolidation of bureaucracy, well, this was a major feature of the absolute state. Second, a very important feature of the absolute state was uh, the element of diplomatic service. Now, before the rise of the absolute state, there was no such conception of diplomatic service. Diplomats were there, but there was as such no proper understanding of what is meant by professional diplomatic service. That is, people to be engaged in diplomatic transactions between one state and another. Now, why it was required? It was required for the reason that as the states began to expand after the end of feudalism. So, what became necessity, what, be, what became uh, very much, uh, what, what became the historical imperative of the hour, the need of the hour, was this, that one has to be engaged, one state has to be engaged in diplomatic relations with another state. One state has to be engaged in bilateral relations with another state. One state has to be engaged in multilateral relations with different states. So that required the requisitioning of, that required the establishment of personnel who will be trained in diplomatic service. And the third most important feature of the absolute state was the notion of sovereignty. Sovereignty, of course, it was theorized, the idea of sovereignty was theorized by uh, Buddha and Hobbes. But sovereignty in its concrete form, sovereignty its concrete manifestation, well, this actually became a contribution of the absolute state. Now, this sovereign power was manifest or expressed, broadly speaking, in two forms, one inward, the other outward. What was the internal manifestation of so sovereignty? The internal manifestation was, or the, in the understanding of internal sovereignty was this, that within its territorial boundaries, the state is absolutely supreme. The state's authority cannot be challenged. The state's authority cannot be questioned by any other authority. So this was the internal manifestation of the notion of sovereignty. What was the external manifestation? External manifestation, in a way, it is known sometimes as the Westphalian model because it is associated with the famous Treaty of Westphalia in Europe. The Westphalian model was this, that once a state, a sovereign state has been formed, its relationship with another sovereign state, well, it cannot be regulated, it cannot be controlled by any other external authority. That is, relations between two states will be conducted by, will be governed by, will be regulated by these two states alone. There will be no other third party which will interfere in the affairs of the state. So this, broadly speaking, this sums up the idea of the absolute state. And all these elements, that is, the notion of bureaucracy, the idea of a diplomatic service, the notion of sovereignty, you can very well understand, they went into the making of the modern state. The modern state 
is we have seen right from the uh, right from the earliest times the modern state actually is the product of a long historical process it began in antiquity the state originated in antiquity in passed through a its pre modern phase then via the rise of the absolute state it reached its modern phase we have seen already that this modern state actually has elements many of which were present even in antiquity some of these elements were present in the pre modern phase and some of these elements then became the constituent elements of the absolute state what we have to keep in mind is this all these elements which flourished which developed in different phases of the historical development of the state whether in antiquity or in the pre modern phase or in the uh, phase uh, which is associated with the rise of the absolute state please remember they all went into the making of the modern state so modern state as we witness it today as an expression of power as an expression of force as an expression of violence well this modern state and which again rules by securing the consent of the governed well all these things are results of a long historical process therefore the modern state cannot be understood the modern state's importance its relevance cannot be appreciated without an understanding of the long historical process the end product of which is the modern state now finally we have to take into consideration the forms of the modern state what are the forms the varieties of modern state broadly speaking there are many variations of course but we will consider say four variations the first variation is associated with the great german sociologist whose name we have already come across that is max weber max weber's whole understanding of the modern state in fact is one of the most sophisticated uh, analysis analysis in the most sophisticated analysis in the sense that max weber has pinpointed max weber has uh, very specifically pointed out what exactly is the element of the modern state what exactly is the feature which differentiates the modern state from its pre modern forms now what is that element the element is according to max weber that the modern state is an expression of force and violence number 1 number 2 the modern state has monopoly power over the exercise of force and violence and number 3 the modern state exercises this monopoly by securing the consent of the governed in the sense that the modern state's exercise of force and violence it is not an arbitrary exercise of power its exercise of force and violence well it is based on legality that is it derives its power from constitution from law so the exercise of force and violence which is associated with the modern state it cannot be legally officially questioned by any other authority this is how the modern state justifies its exercise of force and violence this is the most important contribution of max weber so far as understanding of modern state is concerned all modern democratic states are based on this particular principle the second very important form is associated with uh, karl marx marx's understanding is this well marx is not concerned with the question how the state uh, secures the consent of the governed marx's central concern is what actually is the nature of the state and marx's central understanding is this that the modern state is an expression of force and violence the modern state actually is a kind of state which is controlled by those people who have monopoly 
control over production. The third kind of variation that we come across so far as the understanding of the modern state is concerned, in fact, this is a kind of understanding which we came across in American political science in the 1960s, which is known as the behavioralist understanding of modern state. The state, the behavioralists argued, the state actually is a kind of process, process in the sense, uh, or rather it, it can be uh, viewed as a kind of system which sustains itself through a process. And what is that process? It sustains itself as a system by being engaged in a process of securing inputs from society and then producing the necessary outputs and by balancing the inputs and the outputs, the modern state functions. So, the modern state is actually considered by them, that is the behavioralist as a kind of system. Finally, and with that we conclude, there is a feminist perspective. The, those who are feminists, they believe that the modern state actually is an expression of patriarchy. The modern state is a male dominated institution. So, these are the four forms of the modern state and with that we conclude our discussion of the journey of the state from antiquity to modern phase. Thank you.